Our first scripture reading for this morning comes from the book of Genesis chapter 1, verses 26 through 31, and can be found on page 1 of your pew Bible. Before we read, let us pray. Holy God, make these ancient words find their way into our hearts with new promises this day. Amen. From the beginning, we read, Then God said, Let us make humankind in our image, according to our likeness, and let them have dominion over the fish of the sea, and over the birds of the air, and over the cattle, and over all the wild animals of the earth, and over every creeping thing that creeps upon the earth. So God created humankind in his image. In the image of God, he created them, male and female, he created them. God blessed them, and God said to them, Be fruitful and multiply, and fill the earth and subdue it, and have dominion over the fish of the sea, and over the birds of the air, and over every living thing that moves upon the earth. God said, See, I have given you every plant yielding seed that is upon the face of the earth, and every tree with seed in its fruit. You shall have them for food. And to every beast of the earth, and to every bird of the air, and to everything that creeps on the earth, everything that has the breath of life, I have given every green plant for food. And it was so. God saw everything that he had made, and indeed, it was very good. And there was evening, and there was morning, the sixth day. The Psalms, which are songs, Uh, we read the first half of Psalm 46, will be familiar to many of you, so listen with care that we might hear God's word for us. God is our refuge and strength, very present help in trouble, therefore we will not fear. Even though the earth should change, though the mountains shake in the heart of the sea, though its waters roar and foam, though the mountains tremble with its tumult, there is a river whose streams make glad the city of God, the holy habitation of the Most High. God is in the midst of the city. It shall not be moved. God will help it when the morning dawns. The nations are in an uproar. The kingdoms totter. God utters his voice. The earth melts. The Lord of hosts is with us. The God of Jacob is our refuge. The grass withers and the flower fades, but the word of our God shall stand forever. Amen. So you know the story of Genesis 1. God says, let there be, and there was, and it was good. It tells the story of creation. It's not a scientific story, Genesis 1. No, it's a love story. It doesn't really tell us how the world was created, but rather it is a story that tells us we are not just beings, you and in me, an accident of the evolutionary process, but rather we are creatures. We are fashioned by a creator. And as creatures, we belong to this creator. This story declares that we as human beings belong to the one who fashioned us, who imagined us into being. But this story also affirms that as children of the Creator who belong to God, we have a particular job to do. We have a role to play in creation. I told you before, when when our son was was little, he was into Legos, loved Legos. And he had all the kits, the castle and the spaceship and all the boats, all those 
things, but I found him one day bored with all the architectural plans, and he was taking blocks and pieces and fashioning something out of his own imagination. He was stunned to learn that Legos, that used to be all they were. It's just blocks that you fashioned out of your own imagination. I looked at him. I said, Nathan, what, what are you building? He said, oh, Dad, this is a train. I said, so are you going to build a track for your train to run on? He said, no, Dad, this train flies. I took the bait. I said, Nathan, trains don't fly. He looked at me with an expression I've grown accustomed to over the years. It's an expression that communicates something like, you poor little man. He said, Dad, you see these blocks right here? I put them on here. Dad, these are the engines that make the train fly. I put them here, Dad. I think I know what they're for. <laughs> Fair enough. If you are the creator, you can determine the purpose of the creature. Genesis 1 says that's our relationship with God that God knows what we are for and that God has given us a particular role, a particular job. God says in creation, human beings are to have dominion. Sounds important. To have dominion over all. But what is the character of that dominion? It's tricky. Uh, in James McBride's book, The Good Lord Bird, it's a historical fiction of John Brown and his abolitionist fight in the 1850s. At one point, Brown is confronted by a soldier, uh, one who reports to Jeb Stewart, and the soldier commands Brown. He gives Brown a command to remain in this spot until he can, the soldier can go and get others Brown declares, as one who submits to the will of God, I will do as you command. Then the narrator states, Brown was lying, of course. He believed that God was on his side, so whatever Brown chose to do was by definition the will of God. And if he was obedient to God, he didn't have to be obedient to the government. Then the narrator asserts, Everyone believes that God is on their side in war. Dominion, the temptation with dominion is we can assume that our will and God's will are the same. We can collapse God's will with our own desires to have dominion, we can tell ourselves we are to use the earth and all that is therein as we see fit for our benefit. Dominion really means to dominate. The theologian Douglas Otadi has said the history of interpretation of this Genesis 1 passage has often taken an anthropocentric view of creation. In other words, it's all about us. Uh, we read the first 25 verses of creation as if it's just pregame show, and the story doesn't really get started till verse 26 when we show up. Such an anthropocentric view of creation is what gives room to interpret dominion as domination. All the birds of the air and the beasts of the field and the fruit of the vine exist for us. The biblical theologian Pat Miller, a saintly man and former teacher of mine, he interprets that the dominion we exercise is to reflect the dominion that God exercises. And God's exercise of dominion is always an act of love. You see, the world that God so loved, as John 3.16 says, the world that God so loved is this one. And if we are the creatures who are to have dominion over this world, then our dominion should be an act of love too, should it not? Both theology and science bear witness to this. Theologically, the Scriptures teach us that 
Humans are only part of the creation story. You can't tell the story of the human creature without telling the story of all of creation. We are part of the whole creation, all of which belongs to God. We are part of the whole. The way science affirms this theological truth is to acknowledge that human beings live in an ecosystem. Our lives are tied to the thriving of other creatures, creatures we may not think about or take for granted, but our lives are tied to their help. We're all part of one system. Think of it as one body. And just as how if one part of a body can become diseased, the whole body is sick. In the ecosystem, when part of the ecosystem is stressed or removed, it can skew the balance necessary for humans to thrive. The earth is a great place to live. And the ecosystem in which we thrive is strong, but it is not invincible. Psalm 46 speaks to the fragile places of the ecosystem. Psalm 46 is ultimately a song of comfort. God is our refuge and strength. But the psalm claims that that comfort comes in the midst of chaos. I picked this psalm today because Psalm 46 is actually Genesis 1 in reverse. It, you see, the creation story begins, it says the earth is a formless void, it's just waters. Uh, in Scripture, water is sometimes a beautiful river, a source of life, but too much of it is chaos. In Scripture, often water is a metaphor for chaos that is true in Genesis 1, and it's true in parts of Psalm 46. And what happens in the creation story is from the chaos of the waters, God draws up the dry land, creating some order out of chaos, and it is that order that makes it possible for life to thrive. But in Psalm 46, that process is reversed, and rather than the dry land coming from the waters, the waters begin to cover the dry lands, and the mountains shake in the heart of the sea, and chaos returns, and the ecosystem is thrown out of whack. We live in a version of Psalm 46 these days. Uh, the National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration tracks what they call billion-dollar weather events. These are hurricanes, fires, floods, drought that have an economic impact of a billion dollars or more. Over the last 40 years, since 1980, the average number of billion-dollar weather events per year is seven, but they're climbing. So far this year, as of the first week of October, there have been 18 of these events. And in all of last year, there were not seven, the average, but 22, more than three times the average. The trend is showing not only greater frequency, but increased destruction as a result of the chaotic realities of climate, things are out of whack. So as I was thinking about this, I was reminded of a scene in the movie Apollo 13. It's an illustration of our circumstance. Uh, remember, the crew is in space, in capsule that is in crisis, and amongst the major crisis, there's another crisis that emerges. The CO2, the carbon dioxide in the space capsule is beginning to accumulate and climb, and they don't have a way to filter it out. And if they don't, the astronauts will die, whether they get that capsule to Earth or not. And they only, they must create a fix and they can only use the materials on board the space capsule. Take a look. 
We have a situation brewing with the carbon dioxide. We had a CO2 filter problem on the lunar module. Five filters on the limb. Which were meant for two guys for a day and a half. So I told the doctor... They're already up to eight on the gauges. Anything over 15 and you get impaired judgment blackouts, the beginnings of brain asphyxia. What about the scrubbers on the command module? They take square cartridges. And the ones on the limb are round. <laughs> Tell me this isn't a government operation. It just isn't the contingency we've remotely looked at. Those CO2 levels are going to be getting toxic. Well, I suggest you gentlemen invent a way to put a square peg in a round hole. Rapidly. Okay, people, listen up. People upstairs, hands are dismissed one, and we got to come through. We got to find a way to make this fit into the hole for this. Using nothing but that. Let's get it organized. Okay, okay, let's build a filter. Better get some coffee. Deadly CO2 gas is literally poisoning the astronauts with every breath in and out. Heads up, heads up. Next, people will not come after us. Go, 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 go. Heads up, people, look out now. What's this? That's what they gotta make. Well, I hope you got the procedures for me. Right here. That's it? Affirmative, Andy. Uh, Jack's got one right here. Okay, we have a uh, an unusual procedure for you here. We need you to rip the cover off. I want you to rip the cover off the flight plan. With pleasure. All right, now the other materials you're going to need here are uh, a lithium hydroxide canister. Two, two, two lithium hydroxide canisters. I'm sorry. A uh, roll of gray tape. Duct tape. A duct tape. You need an LCG bag. Two LCG bags. Uh, red suit hoses. We've got the white plate cover. Bit of a parallel to our present circumstance. You know, we need to we need to discover ways to address the realities of the atmosphere using only what we have. The earth is a great place to live. It should stay that way. In Apollo 13, a whole team came together recognizing the problem, not knowing the solution, but committed to finding a fix so that these astronauts could live. I found it inspiring. The present situation is threatening because to borrow the language of the psalmist, the chaos is returning and the mountains are shaking in the heart of the sea. The ecosystem in which we are a part is strong, but it is not invincible. These are not realities about which we can afford to be casual. But there are also folks who are inspiring. There are folks who are doing the good that is theirs to do to address the reality in which we find ourselves. Let me tell you a bit of what I'm talking about. Just down the road, we have beautiful buildings at the Manili Center. It's a center for mission because from our first days, mission has been important to Village Church. And those buildings exist to address the realities of, of food insecurity in our community and and to take care of the littlest ones among us and more. But the mission is not just what happens in those buildings. Their very existence and the way they were brought into being is part of the mission. This is what I mean. They were constructed, mindful of the realities of how construction engages climate change. And so... We followed lead environmental guides to shape our construction. We chose a ground source heat pump. We chose materials that were appropriate, the use of natural light. Outside, there's a monarch butterfly and pollinator garden to, to support the existence of pollinators in the world. That's something that matters to anybody who likes to eat. And then on the Child and Family Development Center, there is across that roof a full array of solar panels 
that are generating electricity from the power of the sun. It offsets the carbon footprint. I'm grateful for that, and I am mindful that we have four buildings and that we need to pay attention to the impact of all of them now. I've learned recently that in the state of Kansas, over 40% of the electricity generated comes from wind power. I'm encouraged by that. It's a good thing. The realities of the climate, it touches every aspect of our lives, from the clothes we wear to the shopping we do and how we do it, and, and to the food we eat and how it is grown on that one. The shift that we made from traditional farming to industrial and feedlot farming was done with the best of intentions to feed as many people as possible, but there was an unintended consequence. And the unintended consequence is it escalated the amount of greenhouse gases that were pushed into the atmosphere. But there are farmers who are finding new ways, and in some way old ways, to go about their work in a more climate-sensitive manner. And there are people, many of you, who choose to eat a diet that reflects care for the environment. I do that. It's a spiritual practice for me. The use of plastic means that our oceans are filled with islands of floating plastic, unbelievably large islands of floating plastic. This threatens ocean life that is intricately tied to the food source of the world and the economic life of many. So when you leave today, we're going to offer you a gift of a Climate Change Matters tote bag that we hope you'll take and use it to to bring home your groceries or other things you might shop for, it'll reduce every time you do. It'll reduce those single-use plastic bags that are so much of our daily world. And our Environmental Action Committee is all the time providing some of the best educational resources about the climate that you'll find anywhere in the city. You check out their website on our, check out their link on our webpage to get that schedule. And also on our webpage under environmental care, there's a list of things that we all can do, things that we all can do, steps that we can take to address the chaos. Now look, we can all do everything we can do and it won't fix it because it's not simply a matter of reducing the carbon footprint like that moment in Apollo 13 we need a global size filter to begin to remove the greenhouse gases from the atmosphere and that will take the commitment of nations and of businesses and of leaders in every aspect of society. And here's what you know. Leaders are often not leaders at all. They are often followers. And so that's where we come in. Let us do the good that is ours to do. It matters. And if we do, our leaders may be inspired to do the good that is theirs to do. And if that happens, then the generations that follow us will look to us like we look to those guys in Apollo 13 who refused to take no for an answer who found a way out of no way, who did all that they could to bring those guys home. We have to decide, is this a moment that is a moment of despair or of inspiration? Is this a moment of chaos or of faithful dominion where we live an act of love for the world that God so loves? For that world is, of course, this one. And this earth 
is a great place to live. It should stay that way. Pray with me. Gracious God, we believe. Help our unbelief. In Christ's name we pray. Amen.